Still as we go for approach sequence four. Copy that. And the SSDC starts to play recorder, please. Still as we go for LAC, please. Still as we go for the first sequence. Still as we go for the first sequence. Copy all. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support our work on Patreon if you can. We appreciate you. I was unsure what lesson to release this week. There are several that we were working on, but in honor of the impending launch, I decided to take a close look at the Artemis One mission, and the SLS rocket that will make it possible. The entire goal of Artemis is to return humans to the moon. The SLS will lift off tomorrow from Launch Complex 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. Here's what it looks like today, getting ready to launch. We have looked at the SLS in passing before, and we've been quite critical of the cost and delays. But make no mistake, the Space Launch System will be the first time in half a century that humanity had a machine capable of taking us to the moon. The SLS will be in this configuration, Block 1 crew, just as it would to carry humans to lunar orbit. I say lunar orbit because the Orion is not designed to land on the moon. That will require a separate human landing system, and NASA has chosen the SpaceX Starship to be this system. There are many images of the SLS that you can find online, and it can be very confusing as the SLS has been in development for a long time and some changes have been made along the way. The SLS is 98 meters tall in the Block 1 or crew configuration, and the central core has a diameter of 8.4 meters. The core stage itself is 65 meters tall. For comparison, it is just a little smaller than the Starship Super Heavy Booster. You could, in fact, slide an SLS core stage completely into the Starship Booster. This core stage has an empty mass of a little more than 85 metric tons. It can hold over 900 tons of propellant, bringing the gross mass to 1,075 metric tons. The core stage is powered by four RS-25 hydrogen-fueled rocket engines. These are the same engines that launched the Space Shuttle, and they have a sea level specific impulse of 366 seconds, with a vacuum specific impulse of 452 seconds. These engines will burn for 480 seconds, each engine producing about 1,860 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level, giving a total launch thrust for all four of 7,440 kilonewtons. If we divide this by 10, we get a rough estimate of the limit of how much mass this could lift. The core stage by itself could lift less than 744 metric tons off the ground. To have an efficient thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, we would need to subtract one-third, and we would get about 500 metric tons lifted. We've already said that the core has a mass of over 1,000 tons by itself. We haven't covered the second stage in payload yet, so we need some high thrust to help get this off the ground. That's where these two solid boosters come in. They are 54 meters tall and 3.7 meters in diameter. For comparison, that is the same exact width as a Falcon 9 rocket. Each of these solid rocket boosters has a mass of 727 metric tons and is made of five segments. These are very similar to the Space Shuttle boosters except they only had four segments. A flex sealed nozzle allows the thrust of these to be vectored in flight. These can produce over 16,000 kilonewtons of force each. Two of these produce 32,000 kilonewtons 
and added to the 7,400 produced by the core stage engines, we get a total of about 39,000 kilonewtons. So about 75% of liftoff thrust is provided by the solid rocket boosters. Again, dividing by 10 and removing one third tells us we can lift about 2,600 tons efficiently. The entire mass of the SLS on launch for Artemis 1 is almost exactly 2,600 metric tons. The boosters will fall away once they've burned all their propellant. They will not be recovered and reused like the space shuttle boosters were. At this point, the boosters have burned for 126 seconds, adding their propellant mass to the rocket's delta V with an efficiency of 269 seconds specific impulse, and will now drop away their empty mass, reducing the load on the core main engines. Once the solid rocket boosters have separated, the aerodynamic panels seen here will fall away. At the end of the Orion capsule when it launched was this structure. This is the Orion launch abort system. This has two parts. A fairing assembly, which is a lightweight composite shell that protects the capsule on launch, during ascent, and in case of an abort and this tower, which contains the abort motor, attitude control motor, and jettison motor. The abort motor produces 39 kilonewtons of thrust. The solid rocket motor in the Orion LAS is the first designed to vector, steer, and control a spacecraft. If something went wrong, this would carry the crew to safety. Once safely on its way to orbit, the SLS will jettison this multi-ton structure. The core stage will continue firing until it has burned all of its fuel. Then it will separate at the launch vehicle stage adapter. This will leave the second stage, ESM and Orion. The second stage is called the cryogenic propulsion stage and has one RL-10 hydrogen and oxygen powered rocket engine. This is a closed expander cycle engine. This engine will then ignite and make a perigee raising burn. Perigee is an orbiting body's closest approach to Earth. Thrust generated on one side of an orbit raises the orbital altitude on the opposite side. A spaceship needs to add delta V on the opposite side of the Earth from their launch point. A burn here at point four will raise the orbit at point six. This burn will allow the remaining SLS components, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the European service module, and the Orion capsule to complete a stable orbit around the Earth and will position it for what is called a translunar injection. As we've noted many times, the RL-10 is the most efficient rocket engine used in space to date. It will produce 110 kilonewtons of thrust and will fire for 1,125 seconds, with 465.5 seconds of specific impulse, which correlates to an exhaust nozzle velocity of 4,565 meters per second. This long burn will add enough delta V to send the ICPS, ESM, and Orion capsule on their way to the moon. After the second stage has burned all of its fuel, it will have been able to send about 27 tons on the translunar injection. Then the second stage will separate and be left behind. This will expose the Orion stage adapter. This section is not just wasted mass to connect the second stage to the European service module. It has a deployment mechanism that can release 10 small CubeSats. These will include the Near-Earth Asteroid Scout mission that will deploy a solar sail so it can fly to a near-Earth asteroid and study it up close, and the Lunar Ice Cube, which will use a spectrometer to map lunar ice, also examining the exosphere, the incredibly thin atmosphere around the moon. The ESM and Orion capsule will then follow this trajectory on their way to the moon. Let's take a closer look at the European service module. It was built by Airbus Defense and Space in Bremen, Germany. The Artemis I mission will be its first flight, though it has been extensively tested at the Space Power Facility, which is part of NASA's Glenn Research Center. The ESM was designed with knowledge gained by the European-built Advanced Transport Vehicle. The ATV was used for space cargo transport from 2008 to 2015 and was launched on the Ariane 5 European rocket system. The ATV helped supply the International Space Station and had three times the cargo capacity of a Russian Progress capsule. The ATVs could also reboost the ISS to maintain its orbit. The Americans had planned to build their own service module, called the Orion Service Module, and it would have looked like this with round solar panels. But the cancellation of the Constellation program 
planned to send humans to the moon a decade ago, didn't leave enough funding to complete the OSM. This led to a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency. ESA agreed to build on its automated transfer vehicle design to make a new service module for Orion. Though the European service module only shares a few components with the ATV. If all goes well on the first flight, a second European service module will help transport humans around the moon on Artemis II. The ESM is 4 meters long and 4.1 meters in diameter, not including the solar panels. With the solar panels, it is 5.2 meters wide when they are folded and 19 meters when extended. The primary engine is a hypergolic OMS engine, taken from the Space Shuttle's orbital maneuvering system. These engines are pressure fed and use monomethylhydrazine as the fuel and dinitrogen tetroxide for an oxidizer. Here you can see how it is laid out. The engine can produce 26.6 kilonewtons of thrust. These will be used on the first five European service modules. Then they plan to switch to the Orion main engine for number six on. The Orion main engine will be produced by Rocketdyne and will replace OMS derived engines. From what I can find, the Orion main engine will be supplied by four propellant tanks. Each of these tanks can hold 2,000 liters and will have a total propellant mass of 9,000 kilograms. The fuel will be monomethylhydrazine, while the oxidizer is mixed oxides of nitrogen. The secondary propulsion system will be eight Aerojet R4D11 thrusters. These thrusters were used on the ATV, and an older version was used on the Apollo service module. They are pressure-fed bipropellant hypergolic engines using monomethylhydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide at 312 seconds specific impulse. They can also use mixed oxides of nitrogen as an oxidizer. Hundreds of these have been flown over the last 50 years and none have ever failed in flight. These each produce 490 newtons of force for a total of 3.92 kilonewtons. Maneuvering, or RCS thrust, is provided by 24 Airbus Reaction Control System engines. These are grouped in pods of four engines each, with six pods placed around the ship. These are also monomethylhydrazine fueled and can use dinitrogen tetroxide, MON1, or MON3 oxidizer. The number after the mixed oxides of nitrogen abbreviation tells you how much nitric acid is mixed in. 1% or 3% up to 25%. The nitric acid lowers the freezing point. Think of it as antifreeze for rocket engine oxidizers. When it comes to electrical power, the old Apollo service modules used fuel cells, but the European service module will use solar panels and produce twice as much power. The panels generate 11.2 kilowatts of electricity from four 7.4 meter wings with three panels on each wing. Total launch mass for a lunar mission is 13,500 kilograms with 240 kilograms of water, 90 kilograms of oxygen, and 30 kilograms of nitrogen. The ESM can carry up to 380 kilograms of other payload. The structure is mostly made from aluminum alloy with some stainless steel. The tanks are titanium, and the insulation is Kapton. Kapton has been used since the 60s and is a polyamide film stable from 4 Kelvin up to 673 Kelvin. It is also used in printed circuit boards. And you can see it here in orbit insulating the ultra heavy cosmic ray experiment, which was the size of a school bus and was carried into space by the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1984. It was returned to Earth in 1990 by the Space Shuttle Columbia. It is tragically ironic that it went up on one doomed shuttle and came down on another. The orbital maneuvering system engine being used by the European service module will make an outbound trajectory correction burn about here to make sure that the ship goes into a close lunar flyby. NASA calls this a powered flyby. So the ship is using its engine to amplify the effect of the moon's gravity to help throw the capsule into a distant retrograde orbit. This will put the ship about 70,000 kilometers from the moon before the moon's gravity pulls it back. The ship will leave the distant retrograde orbit and fall back to orbit the moon again. On this side of the moon, the ESM will fire its engine one more time in a return powered flyby, again using the moon's gravity to throw the ship back toward Earth. We can call this a trans-Earth injection burn if we want to. The ship will now fall back toward Earth making a correction burn here if needed. As the ship gets close to the Earth, the ESM will separate. 
the Orion will now be falling back at about 11,200 meters per second. The Orion is the only spaceship built today, able to withstand the incredible heat generated by a lunar return mission. The Dragon capsule would not survive without extensive modifications and a reinforced heat shield. The Orion will deploy its parachutes and come down to land in the ocean. The entire mission will have taken up to 42 days. During that time, instruments, some of them enclosed in mannequins on the capsule, will have recorded G-force loading, radiation levels, environmental control systems function, propulsion system performance, and the guidance, navigation, and control systems. If everything works the way it's designed, the next mission, Artemis II, will carry humans. This may seem like a tall order, but despite cost overruns and delays, most of the SLS is proven technology. The solid rocket boosters are like those from the shuttle program. The core stage engines are space shuttle main engines proven to be efficient and reliable. The RL-10 has been flying in space for half a century. The orbital maneuvering system engine design on the ESM flew over a hundred missions on the space shuttles. We hope everything goes perfectly for the SLS and DSM Orion and congratulate everyone who worked on this amazing example of human engineering. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astro Proterra.